now we're gonna get to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves this basically is gonna kind of sum it all up together uh, everything we talked about oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is and why is this you know so much uh, important for us right so here we see essentially three curves we see green red and uh, uh blue the we're gonna say the red curve is the the normal curve right uh of hemoglobin the blue curve is right shifted the green curve is left shifted so the green curve if it's left shifted it means it's in what configuration relaxed relaxed is correct right if it's relaxed. right shifted Right shifted, what configuration is it for? Tense. Tense, Tense. right, good, State. excellent, right? So I'm, uh, I'm gonna just pick a, an arbitrary number just, just to show you, uh, right? Let's just say we use 60% uh, saturation. So on the Y axis, on this axis, this is, shows you saturation of hemoglobin. So imagine just an easy way to think about it. If I put up, you know, pulse ox on your finger, right? And I connect it to my monitor. I'm looking at the saturation on this end. And here I'm looking at the pressure of oxygen at the bottom graph. So if I took 60, I'm just going to draw straight li lines down. So if I have 60% saturation, I'm going to see to what pressure it corresponds to for every single curve here. Right? So we see for the normal one, the red one, let's just, Let's just say it's it's 30 here. Here we're gonna say it might be 45. And this is 20. So 20, 30, and 45. So uh in the normal in, in the normal curve, for me to get saturation of 60 and I offload 40% of my hemoglobin, I gotta get to the pressure of 30. On the right shift, for me to get saturation of 60, I gotta get to a pressure of 45. And for me to get a saturation of, of 60 on the green curve, I got to get to a pressure of 20. It's much, it's, it's much easier to get a pressure of 45, right? To get the same saturation, then keep dropping the pressure further. So the, the dropping the pressure further, it means that hemoglobin wants to hold to oxygen more tighter, more tighter. Here, they, they basically show you the effects of acidosis. They say acidosis or hypercapnia, uh, and they call it the Bohr effect, which we talked about. And you see, right, uh, the, the, the way acidosis works, so you, your normal blood is 735 to 745 on the pH scale. If you go this way, right, as, as you drop this number further, you become more acidic. As you go this way and increase the number, 746, 747, you become more alkaline. So here you see on the graphs, right? Uh, the the one in the middle, the red the, the red graph is seven point four. That's basically uh, right here, seven point four. That's our normal pH. If I right shift, right, and you see here my pH dropped to seven point two. So I become more acidotic. So if I become more acidotic, right, we said for all those reasons, right? Uh, H plus carbon dioxide, hypercapnia means high um, carbon dioxide level, they will right shift, they'll cause the hemoglobin to switch to the 10 state, and this will offload oxygen. So I to get saturation of 60, I only got to get to a pressure of 45. So that means that I, there's not a much uh, uh, as much work I have to do as opposed to, you know, a normal, right, where I get to a 30. Uh, same thing for, you know, um, for the relaxed state. I got to drop it way, way, way further for it to start offloading. It wants to hold to this auction so, so tightly. So where all this comes to play for you guys, right? Uh, where this becomes very, very important for you is uh, when you, first of all, when you're bagging someone with a BVM, right? Let's just say you're not even, in, you're not even yet um, trying to, Intubate. Let's just say you're on a BLS level and you have a septic patient. And we said septic patient, they they want to extract oxygen because they're metabolically active. They, they, their tissues are craving for that oxygen. And you're coming in and you instead of bagging them one breath every five to six seconds, your adrenaline is through the roof and you're ventilating them one breath every two seconds. And you sustain that throughout your transport, right? Uh, uh, 
from the point of contact through your transport. So what do you think that high rate will do the, to CO2, high rate to carbon dioxide? Will, it, will carbon dioxide go up or will it go down with, with BVM every two seconds? We'll go down. Go down. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to go down, right? So what do I, I expect to my uh, curve? To, to stay the same or, okay. or to switch to the right or left? The CO2 switch is to the, right. Right to the left. To the left. I expect it's switched to the left. Why? Because if you remember, if you remember that formula, right? We said CO2 plus H2O, H2, CO3, H plus, right? HCO3 minus. So if, if I'm if I'm bagging them aggressively once every two seconds, I'm basically moving this this way so that the CO2 can get rid of um, in the lungs. And by doing so, I'm going to make them more alkalotic, right? I'll make them uh, more towards alkaline side. Uh, and this will move my hemoglobin curve towards the left. And here, you notice hemoglobin is now what? The, it starts to hold on to the oxygen much more strongly because it's switching to that relaxed state. And what we will do to the tissues, the tissues are now going to be even more starved because as the oxygen comes in, right? Yeah, you, you load it in the lungs, but it comes to the tissues and it, they're having a hard time to offload. So your aggressive bagging uh, has switched the hemoglobin to uh, a more relaxed state and it doesn't want to give up its you know, oxygen stores. So that's important. So, Number one, the other important factor is when you're trying to pre-oxygenate someone prior to intubation. So the same same thing will apply. I I want to pre-oxygenate them, but I you know I start bagging them so fast because I'm looking at my pulse ox and my pulse ox is 93 percent. You know it's not increasing rapidly. So I start bagging them instead of uh, once every five to six seconds. I start doing it every two seconds because I know I got to get my saturation to 100. That's what we told you. I want to get it as high as possible. And you start bagging them, and you're again going to left shift them. And if the person is in shock, and they need all that oxygen they could get, you're basically not allowing them at the tissue level, right, to extract that oxygen from the hemoglobin. Right? So um, I just want to show you, right, all the, the changes it will do. So here, the, the high temperature will also right shift. So we see this is 33, 37, 41. Uh, this is in Celsius. So high temperature will right shift. Makes sense, right? In a septic patient who has fever, right? The tissues want to uh, extract that uh, oxygen from the hemoglobin, right? This is, uh, shows you the effect of pH. So as the pH drops, you become more acidotic, right? 7.2. Uh, it is going to right shift. Same thing for carbon dioxide. So both of these pH and CO2, this is the Bohr effect, right? Both, both of those things will, uh, the high, sorry, dropping of pH or low pH and elevation of CO2 will right shift. Uh, the opposite, right? Elevation of pH becoming more alkaline or getting rid of CO2, like with aggressive bagging is going to left shift your oxyhemoglobin to the left, making it more relaxed, right? So um, this is, we all talked about, how does it work in terms of um, relaxed state and tense state? Um, right? And we talked about this, right? Uh, so in uh, increased PCO2 and uh, what's going to happen is going to unload O2. Why this is occurs? Because it switches to this uh, tense state, right? Uh, and it causes the right shift. So all of this is pretty much just summing this up. The, the, the last thing here uh, in your slide, right? Uh, there was something known as 2,3-DPG, right? 2,3-DPG, or sometimes it's called 2,3-BPG. So the difference is this is diphospho, diphosphoglycerate, but this is called biphospho. So the, the name is the same, right? So DPG or BPG, they all mean the same thing, right? Don't get confused with the names. So DPG, BPG is all the same. What, what, is, what is this compound? So this compound is found in your body all the time, right? Through the process of glycolysis, uh, 
your body makes this compound, it circulates into your circulatory system, right? And the more 2,3 DPG you make, so the more you make it, it's going to right shift, right? Your hemoglobin, this is basically, this molecule is negative charge, right? And it's going to make it more tense, your hemoglobin more tense. So it wants to get rid of your um, oxygen, right? 2,3 DPG. So uh, where, where is this becomes important, right? So this is just the formula shows you uh, in the presence of 2,3 DPG, when it binds to the hemoglobin, it's going to go this way and it's going to offload oxygen. So where this becomes important, right? Let me show you a diagram. So this is fetal circulation, right? So the placenta is obviously, right, coming from the mother. And this is your fetus here, right? So... As you know, right, in the utero, in your uterus, the, um, the baby, as long as they're not yet functional, right, the baby cannot take a breath in and inhale oxygen through the atmosphere. So where does it get its oxygen from? From the mother. From the mother, right? Oh. With, uh, with that, the, there has to be some sort of a mechanism. You know, why would mom's hemoglobin wants to give oxygen to the baby? Because mom needs to have oxygen as well, right? So the difference is this, uh, in the mom's hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin, we, we just said there's two alpha chains and there's two beta chains, but in fetal hemoglobin, hemoglobin fetus, there's two alpha chains and there is two gamma. There's no beta chains. And the other important factor in mom, mom can bind to three DPG uh, to the beta chains to make it tense, right? But the gamma, in the fetal cannot bind to 3DPG. So the fetal hemoglobin does not bind to 3DPG. So if it does not bind to 3DPG, uh, it's going to take relaxed. Form. So if it takes the relaxed form, it wants to hold on to the oxygen more tighter, right? So because fetal hemoglobin cannot bind to 3DPG and mom's hemoglobin does in fact bind to 3DPG. So when mom's hemoglobin with 2,3-DPG gets to the placenta and the baby's uh, hemoglobin is circulating here, right? And um, next to the capillaries, it will basically pull off oxygen from the mom's hemoglobin because in the relaxed form, there's no 2,3 DPG. Uh, so it will steal the oxygen from the tensed form. And that's how the baby gets its um, oxygen supply. Once the baby is born, right, uh, you know, the transition will occur, you know, after about, you know, six, eight months, uh, the gamma globin uh, will start to become uh, beta globin, right? So it will form to adult hemoglobin. But that's pretty much... Uh, the importance of 2,3 DPG, right? Uh, uh, in terms of fetal circulation uh, and mom circulation here, right? And uh, we talked about that, right? Uh, just to show you all this, right? How do we make 2,3 DPG is basically when we break down glucose and the process of gly glycolysis, right? In this step, there's a enzyme, uh, diphosphoglycerate mutase. This is just... Uh, Right, 2, 3 DPG, the name of the diphosphoglycerate mutase, it makes this. Uh, and it circulates in our body. So we always have it in our body. And the utility of it comes in, right? It, it cross-links the hemoglobin into the tense form for it to offload oxygen. Uh, the, the fetal hemoglobin does not have, uh, on the gamma globin chains, does not have binding pockets for 2, 3 DPG. So it... Uh, wants to take the relaxed form. And when mom's uh, hemoglobin comes in, you know, in the circulation, it will basically steal, right, the oxygen content. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, the uh, few other things that I want to get to, right, I showed you, I showed you the slide. What is this? So the, this is the arterial blood supply, this is the venous blood supply, and this is basically how is the predominance uh, of your carbon dioxide is carried in the blood, right? So the, the formula, right, was CO2 plus H2O, H2CO3, 
and then it dissociates into H plus plus H CO3. Minus. So you notice, right? This is this is your carbon dioxide. How it's carried in your um, body, predominant is in this bicarbonate form. Uh, some of it here is in carboamino form. It means it's bound directly to hemoglobin, right? Uh, not on the not on the iron itself, right? On um, the uh, the carboamino portion of it, right? On the globin chain. And then some of it, some CO2 is dissolved, but it's very minimal. Remember uh, in the other um, lecture, I said CO2 is not really easily dissolved, right? Uh, but some of it does get dissolved that it's carried. Uh, this is basically uh, here, this is just the difference between arterial and venous side. But the bulk, what I want to get to, the bulk of CO2 in your body is carried in this form as a bicarbonate form, this form here. So bicarbonate form is how you found most of your CO2. Uh, in your body. Okay. Um, this is, this is, uh, they basically, they did an experiment just to show you, right, all of this stuff we were talking about. They took whole blood and they plotted in the oxyhemoglobin association curve. Red is the whole blood, like found in your body. And here they took hemoglobin, they took away uh, all the other components. They took away carbon dioxide, they took away uh, 2 3 dpg they took away carbon dioxide and you notice it's left shifted right but as they start adding to to that stripped hemoglobin they start adding carbon dioxide 2 3 dpg right uh um to it right you notice it becomes more right shifted up to the point where hemoglobin that's combined with dpg co right carbon dioxide it's very similar to the whole blood uh, and that's that's how it basically functions so you see that uh, brown and red curve are basically very similar together uh, and that's why whole blood functions the way it does, right? Uh, that's why um, at this stage, right, and here, right, this is where the all-loading in the lungs occurs. And on this side, this is where offloading in the tissues occurs, 40, right? We said that the tissues are close to 100 uh, in the, uh, right, your um, lungs. And the other important thing that I want to uh, point your attention to Actually, let me see if I can go to the other curve. I think that one looked better that I was drawing. And yeah, you notice, you notice on the normal, on the red one, as I make my way down, right? Let's say, let's, let's pick saturation of 90, let's say 90s here. So on the red one, as I, as I keep going down, is, is my curve steep or it's gradual decline? Gradual. Gradual. And the moment I, I, I go past 90, what happens? It's a steep decline, right? So that means that as I'm, as I'm desaturating, right, I'm slowly, 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 slowly going down. But the moment I get to 90, there's a rapid drop. Means uh, The rapid drop basically means hemoglobin offloads its oxygen, right? It, it becomes desaturated. Why is this important for you for your intubation purposes, right? The reason why this is important, if I'm watching the pulse ox, right? And my pulse ox shows me, right? Uh, during my attempt, I see 91, right? 90. Should I be keep um, going and trying to find my vocal cords? Or should I stop and bag them up? Stop and bag them? Yeah, absolutely. Right. You, want to you want to stop and bag them because here you have some time frame, right? You have some time frame, but here it's a rapid drop. From here to here on a healthy person, I may have four minutes, four or five minutes, right? Um, truly speaking, you probably have more if you pre them properly, right? If you had them to 100% on a, on a healthy person, you could probably say seven, eight minutes. On a sick person, you could probably get four or five minutes. But from here to here could be seconds. So, so the drops here, uh, the moment I get my, you know, 90%, there's a rapid drop. And that's what I want to avoid, right? I don't want to trying to find my vocal cords uh, when the pulse ox is below 90. And this is a common reason why patients get killed in hospitals is they give them medications to paralyze them when they try to intubate. And they, you know, taking too long to intubate. And instead of stopping the procedure when the saturation is at 90%, they continuing saying, you know, I, I almost had it. 
and the patient critically desaturates and they plummet down. Uh, and this can cause a person to go into cardiac arrest, right? So as we go to our final point of this that I wanted to make, right? This, so the, uh, as I was saying, right, the predominant a portion of your CO2 is carried in the bicarbonate form, right? Bicarbonate is this HCO3 minus, and you see, right, the contribution, the percentage of it is 90% in your arterial blood, and in your venous blood, it's 88%. So that's what you want to remember. CO2 is carried as bicarbonate in your, in your, in your uh, body. The carboamino makes about 5%. It's 0.2 in your venous blood. All right. Uh, so th this is what basically uh, I was just explaining, right? When you're, when you are, when we're going to be practicing the skill and um, when we start the intubation skill, you're going to be placing the patients on your monitor and you want to be uh, attentive to uh, this number here and you want to be attentive to this number here. So what these numbers are So at the bottom, this is your waveform capnography. This is your uh, PCO2. Um, and this is your uh, saturation SAO2, right? Now, what, I, what you want to do is you want to connect your BVM, right? Your BVM portion of it to uh, capnography, right? So you want to measure your ETCO2. So this, this here. Why do you want to measure this? Because every time I squeeze a bag, it will give me this waveform. So I know every breath that I gave is going in, right? There is something known as a pulse X log, lag, meaning that uh, this, this number that you see 99, right? This is not real time. This is in the past. How much in the past depends on the person's uh, condition, how sick they are and their cardiac output. So if they're very, very sick, this may be two, two minutes, three minutes in the past. So when you actually seeing it's dropping, the real one may be way lower. So like when you're seeing it becoming 93, the real one may, may actually be 89 because of lag time. But the PCO2 will be real time because every time I squeeze a bag, I see this waveform. I know my breath went in. So if when I start to ventilate someone to pre them for, for the procedure, right, and my pulse ox is not rapidly increasing, I know my breaths went in because I see this. This, this will not go up if your breath did not go in. So what I do is I don't increase my rate on my ventilation because A, I know if I do that, I'm going to left shift them on my oxyhemoglobin curve. So I only give one breath every five to six seconds for adult patient seeing this waveform. And I connect my adapter to my BVM when I do this. I am watching my pulse ox. If I'm doing this correctly, right, it will still rise. I use a two-handed technique. I put an adjunct, right? I, I put two adjuncts if the patients can tolerate the OPA. I'll put an OPA and a nasal pharyngeal airway. And then I use a two-handed technique uh, to, to pre oxygenate them, one breath every five to six seconds. So I know my breaths go in every five seconds, I squeeze my back. Once this number gets to 100 um, or as high as I can, right? 99 here, right? As high as I can. I know it's reliable when my waveform is good. So my waveform is good. And then I spend a few more minutes longer, keep ventilating them, why? Because your atmospheric oxygen that you are breathing is about 79% nitrogen, right? Uh, and 21% oxygen. And the, what I'm trying to do with the pre oxygenation I want to not only get their saturation to 100%, I want to remove all this nitrogen from the lungs. I want to denitrogenate their lungs. I want to make all of this to be 100% oxygen in the lungs. This is what gives me the time frame, right, uh, to essentially uh, be able to have that uh time to safely intubate so just to repeat connect your adapter one breath every five to six i'm looking for this this is real time this has lag if the patient is very sick it may be two three minutes in the past shows this shows me two three minutes in the past for a sick person right so if if you on a sick person see this to be 89 they may be already critically desaturated to the levels of imminent cardiac arrest right so your your um numbers i would say May uh, like hard cutoff should be 90, but you should start to bag them up at maybe at 93, go back and to ventilate them, right? So this is the monitor. This is the graph that I was talking to you, right? Here at 90%, you have time frame. So if you pre-oxygenate your, your person to 100%, I'm going to 
up until the 90, right? You see the graph is gradually decreasing. But the moment you hit 90, right? It's a very brief moment. And then you have rapid desaturation. You, you have critical desaturation. This is not the time to continue your attempts. This is the time to stop and back them up, right? And this graph is basically, this was from the lecture slides. This basically shows you uh, at this point, right? Up until 90%, there will be low risk, meaning you got time, right? Here, they have high, uh, higher risk. And here, right past 90%, they'll become they'll become hypoxic quickly. It's rapid decline. I personally seen patients being killed because of this, right? Where the uh, junior doctor said, I, I, let me get a few more minutes. I almost got it. Just let me just go. And you hear um, the alarms going off and the patient is in, uh, uh, you know, you see ventricular tachycardia on the monitor, right? So this is um, uh, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Uh, we talked about the carbon monoxide, right? 200 time a preference for binding as opposed to your O2, right? And it switches the conformation. And uh, we talked about all um, this already, right? The poisoning, what happens with poisoning? It basically binds so tightly, 200%, right? Increase a greater capacity. So it doesn't want to uh, offload what happens is uh, it snaps, right? It snaps hemoglobin to this relaxed state where basically um, oxygen does not want to get, get rid, you know, come off, right? So we spoke about that. Uh, uh, does anyone have any questions before we proceed with the first question? Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how do you know when you have achieved a uh, proper nitrogen washout? Yeah, so I would say you want to do that, the procedure. There's, they give you some time frames, but uh, if you're doing, if you're using a BVM, two to three minutes should suffice. If you're using a non rebreather mask, they say about eight vital capacity breaths, right? Eight, eight vital capacity. So if I put a non rebreather on a person, you take full in and out eight breaths, you should denitrogen your lungs. But uh, two, three minutes is probably a good time frame for that. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Nick. Yeah. Um, the, the role of 2,3 uh, DPG. Yes. Uh, is, is that the only thing that makes the uh, hemoglobin tense or relaxed? No. Uh, so the, the, the role of 2,3 DPG, why I brought this up, is it, it, that's one of the primary things for fetal uh, circulation, right? So let me go back to that slide that I had. 2,3 uh, DPG we make in our body. It's always there, right? And especially when we need more oxygen, actually, we'll, the body is going to go into glycolysis, which I have here, right? So when you have low oxygen, your body... Uh, will go into glycolysis to make more 2,3-DPG. But what's so special about 2,3-DPG is that our uh, uh, beta chains in, in hemoglobin, right? Because hemoglobin, we said, is, a, is tetramer. There's four right units, uh, alpha-1, beta-1, alpha-2, beta-2. The beta units, they bind 2,3-DPG. And they cross-link, making into tenths form. But the fetal hemoglobin is, is a tetramer, but it doesn't have uh, beta. Alpha, gamma 1, alpha 2, gamma 2. This does not bind to 3 DPG. So if it does not bind to 3 DPG, it, it's going to keep the relaxed form. Relaxed form has higher affinity for oxygen. means it wants to grab oxygen. It wants to snatch oxygen. So when the maternal and fetal meet at the placenta, the maternal having 2,3 DPG is in the 10 state, wants to get rid of oxygen. Fetal being lack of 2,3 DPG in a relaxed state wants to snatch oxygen. This is favorable physiology, so it will basically pick up the oxygen from the maternal side. Uh, this is why it's beneficial for the fetal. As the baby is born, about you know, six to eight months, it will start to transition to, instead of hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin is going to go into hemoglobin A, which is the adult hemoglobin, right? Oh, okay. That's what I missed. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any other questions? So is that a quick question about the monitor? Sure. So what are you exactly seeing on the monitor again? Can yeah. you just go back to that slide? Yeah, no problem. So this, I, I'm showing you a uh, life pack 15, but we're going to be in the class. We have life pack 12. We have MRX monitors. 
the brand of name uh, is not as important. What's important for now, what I want to point your attention to. So this, the blue number here, this is saturation of your pulse ox, right? Yeah. So this is pulse ox. Yeah. So if I put this on your finger, it tells me this number. Uh, this is your heart rate. Usually the heart rate, if you have the patient on the ECG monitor, right, will show you the readout from these waveforms. So this is your ECG. Um, this number 35 is the measurement of your CO2, this here, right? The probe that I put on my BVM and the waveform that you generate from it, from it is at the bottom. You notice how the colors match. So blue goes with blue, uh, you know, uh, uh, orange or brown goes with brown, right? So this here uh, goes with that, right? So it shows, it shows me uh, that number. You can also calculate my respiratory rate. Here you have your blood pressure. But for, for, the, for the purposes right now that we are focusing on, that what you want to be looking at is this number, which is your ETCO2, normal value is 3545. And this is the waveform it makes. And for your pulse ox, this is your pulse ox. Normal values is 95 to 100. And this is the waveform it makes. It kind of looks like an arterial waveform. Why? Because it's on your finger. It's measuring your arterial pulsations, right? And What's the number 37? Now, 37 here, it, I think it's just the respirations that it calculated from, from there, I believe. The, uh, these monitors can also show... Um, I think it's temperature. Yeah, it can also show temperature. It can also show you temperature that is correct, right? So it could be a, a temperature probe or it could be a, a respiratory rate, so depending on what they have connected to it. Uh, this here is your uh, blood pressure, 120 over 80, I think. So basically... The lower the end total CO2, you're going to bag them slower? Uh, vice not, versa? Not necessarily. So I mean, Not slower, but uh, like five to six seconds. So, uh, so okay. So, you, so this, 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 this is a little bit more involved, right? So I'll, so I'll give you, I don't want to tell you wrong information. Uh, so I'll tell you the right information. I hope it is not going to confuse everyone. <laughs> um, for example, let's say you have a patient in diabetic ketoacidosis, right? And they're breathing very fast. They're breathing very fast. Why? Because they want to offload a CO2 because they have high amount of uh, acidosis in their body, right? Diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. So when I place them on my monitor and I place them on the BVM and before even um, squeezing, squeezing the, the bag, you know, like several times, like after a breath, I could see, I could see their number. So let's say their number is... 30 to begin with, right? The reason why they are at 30 is not because of me squeezing the back fast. I just put it on them. I maybe gave only one or two breaths, right? And I see 30. The reason why you see 30 is not because I'm squeezing too fast. The reason why you're seeing 30 is of their inherent compensation. So whatever is going on in their body, they're compensating. So maybe they're breathing at a rate of 30 to blow off, to blow off CO2 to compensate for their metabolic acidosis. And those patients... You want to maintain this number, whatever it is, whatever their inherent number is. That's what I'm maintaining it. On the other hand, if you have that patient who is, uh, you know, um, let's say, is in respiratory uh, failure, secondary to heroin overdose, I put this on, I gave a breath, and their number is, let's say, 56. In those patients, yeah, for those patients, you want to get it back to, you know, your number 35, 45. Maybe you want to get it back to 40, right? But for those patients where this number is less than 35, I will first look what's going on with the patient. So if they're breathing very fast and they're floating it, I will not want to slow down on my uh, bag. I would want to maintain this number. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I will. When we talk about more, like a, a little bit more advanced topics, uh, I will explain why. Why is this important? You have a diabetic ketoacidosis patients that's breathing at a rate of 30, let's say, and their number here is, let's say, 30. And they go to the hospital and they paralyze them to intubate and nobody bags for them, they will die, right? Because there's no compensation any longer. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions? No. But yeah, I think this, this is probably a temperature probe here. I agree. 37, uh, and it's probably central uh, uh, temperature. Uh, we um, we have these connections here, right, for the monitor. So you could have you could basically uh, 
put other, you could have arterial waveforms, uh, venous waveforms. So depending on configuration that you have uh, different modules, you could have different waveforms on it.